Hello everyone, I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is The Dark Matter of Cancer Genomics, Revealing Undetected Structural Variants in Leukemia, and our sponsor is BioNanoGenomics. Our panelists today are Dr. James Broach, Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and Director of the Penn State Institute for Personalized Medicine at Penn State College of Medicine, and Dr. Alex Hasty, Director of Customer Solutions and Applications at BioNanoGenomics. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which usually appears at the right side of the webinar screen. If you look to the tray at the bottom of your window, you'll see a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Broach. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Christy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about work we've been doing recently on identifying structural variations uh, in cancer. Um, sorry. Um, so that is the topic of today's uh, webinar. Um, and just as a prelude, uh, as most of you in the audience know, cancer is a somatic genetic disease. Um, we often uh, manifest with uh, extreme genomic instability. And in the extreme case in uh, the figure shown here, um, there are massive numbers of genome rearrangements as identified by karyotype and um, chromosome painting. Um, and that led us to uh, look for methods to be able to identify uh, fairly exhaustively those structural rearrangements that could be associated with cancer. We initially focused on leukemia for a number of reasons, and, and in particular uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Now, the first reason is that uh, leukemia uh, patients provide us with a ready source of relatively pure uh, cancer material, that is the tumor, uh, simply because the, uh, the blood sample that we can take readily from the patient uh, is uh, the tumor. Uh, the second reason to think about focusing on AML is that there has been an extensive um, genomic analysis previously performed by the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, on AML. Um, and these have identified a number of uh, point mutations that arise in, um, as drivers of AML, as identified on this slide. Uh, but in addition to these point mutations, um, uh, AML is associated with a number of uh, structural rearrangements. Uh, in this slide, in which uh, summarizes the work of uh, the results from about 1,500 patients, uh, in which each patient is one of the horizontal lines and each uh, uh, column is a particular uh, mutation or a genome rearrangement, uh, you can see that there's quite a variety of structural uh, of changes that are associated uh, with the um, progression of AML. Uh, in particular, there are a number of point mutations as previously uh, identified, but it, uh, further than the point mutations, there are also a large number of um, structural rearrangements uh, that are associated with the um, uh, uh, onset of cancer and that are um, identified as potential drivers of the uh, of the cancer. So, what are outlined uh, in the uh, in the red boxes are uh, structural variations, either gene fusions or translocations or inversions. Um, or um, uh, amplifications and aneuploidies. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, take-home lesson from uh, this slide is that um, AML is quite a diverse uh, cancer with a number of different drivers. And in fact, uh, the group that provided uh, this study uh, suggests from analysis that there are at least 16 different subtypes uh, based on the genomic underpinnings of the AML. Uh, in addition to simply identifying different drivers, uh, this information also provides uh, prognostic uh, uh, data. So uh, on the, this slide, you can see the outcomes. These are Kaplan-Meier plots showing the survival uh, as a function of time uh, for individuals with different uh, subtypes of AML and AML drivers. So as evident on the left, um, it is clear that um, if you're unlucky enough to have um, uh, AML, 
but are lucky enough to have that AML driven by an inversion of chromosome 16, uh, the likelihood that you'll be uh, that you'll survive after 10 years is quite high. <clears throat> On the other hand, if your AML is driven by an inversion of chromosome 3, uh, the likelihood of survival is quite low. So being able to identify the the mutations and structural variations uh, that are responsible for the AML in a patient is really important in being able to predict uh, how aggressive one needs to be in treating that cancer. The other thing that's evident from this is that uh, even if you have a um, uh, inversion in an AML with driven by an inversion in 16, uh, there are individuals who actually will succumb early uh, and similarly, even if you have an inversion in three uh, as the driver in your AML, there are folks who will, patients who will survive for quite a long time. So it suggests that either there's a, this is quite stochastic or that there are other uh, modifiers present in these cancers that may uh, affect the outcomes. Uh, so we were interested in trying to identify all of the structural variants as well as the point mutations that are present in a particular genome to really get a full picture uh, of the uh, genetic and genomic basis of individual cancers. So to do so, um, we wanted to build uh, individual cancer genomes that were um, uh, constructed in the absence of a reference genome in order to be able to capture uh, any large structural variation. Uh, and the problem is that um, using the standard genomic techniques of short read sequencing, such as that provided by Illumina sequencing, uh, it's very difficult to build a de novo uh, sequence by um, uh, taking individual reads and uh, developing uh, contiguous uh, maps from that uh, because of the repetitive sequences that are present in the human genome. So um, to address this, uh, we have used two complementary uh, genomic tools to be able to uh, begin to get a good catalog of the genetic variations that are associated with these leukemias. So uh, those two uh, techniques that are quite complementary, as I'll show you, one is the whole genome sequencing, which most of you are familiar with, that is um, uh, done in our lab on the Illumina NovaSeq uh, platform. Uh, but the second uh, technique is the optical mapping using uh, bio-nanogenomics um, uh, sapphire or iris instruments. So just to uh, let you, uh, to, to introduce you to the bio-nano system, uh, it is basically a microfluidic device uh, that, uh, in which DNA, large uh, segments of DNA are imaged individually uh, on uh, these uh, nanofabricated chips um, that then can be placed in the instrument, which is basically uh, a um, set of uh, plumbing plus uh, a microscope and a camera to take images of the um, DNA molecules as they go through the chips. So just to focus in on the chips, uh, these, as I indicated, are sets of uh, nanochannels, uh, and these nanochannels uh, are just uh, the width uh, of uh, a molecule of DNA, so that DNA that is traveling through these nanochannels have to assume a strictly linear form, uh, which allows us then precise measurements of distances between along a particular individual DNA molecule. Uh, and the trick uh, for these uh, uh, nano channels uh, is uh, the front end of, of these uh, uh, chips, which have a set of pegs, uh, and these pegs serve to unwind uh, the DNA um, to untangle it uh, prior to their entry and to allow entry into the nano channels. Um, so the approach to taking advantage of these uh, ability to image individual DNA molecules is to be able to barcode those molecules based on uh, sequences resident uh, within the DNA. So the approach is to uh, first extract a very large uh, 
DNA molecules by gentle extraction. Uh, and these, uh, the, this protocol yields molecules on the other uh, order of uh, several hundred kilobases to megabase uh, in length. And prior to running these on the nanochannels, uh, these molecules are, are barcoded by using an enzyme that recognizes a specific six or seven base sequence uh, and inserts a fluorescent uh, label uh, at that site. Uh, these are then applied to the chip uh, and uh, put in the instrument and run uh, for imaging. So uh, if you can see on yes, uh, the slide now, this is a, a picture of the chips uh, in which the DNA is stained uh, to, uh, in a green color. And you can see that the pegs untangle the DNA allow them to go through the first stage of the um, uh, nanochannels that then uh, focus into uh, the nanochannels, that, again, that are just the width of a, a single DNA molecule. So all you saw there was the um, uh, DNA, but in actual fact, the, you, we imaged both the DNA, which was shown in blue on these streaks here, uh, plus the label uh, where the, that particular sequence resides on that particular molecule. So these images are then what is collected uh, in the instrument. Um, and then uh, by uh, photographing and then converted into digital images that uh, basically identify the positions of those uh, uh, labeled site-specific um, regions. Uh, and uh, from that image, then we can, then we can uh, develop, um, uh, align the individual molecules so we have uh, overlapping uh, molecules to be able to create a uh, large contiguous uh, map of the uh, region around individual molecules that can then be fully assembled into a whole genome. Uh, and once we have assembled in the genome, uh, the cancer genome de novo, we can compare that um, assembled genome to a reference genome to ask, is it precisely the same, or are there insertions, deletions, inversions, translocations, et cetera? So here's an example of uh, real data that we've uh, obtained for uh, one of these samples. The orange uh, lines on the bottom are the actual DNA molecules that were imaged uh, with the tick marks indicating where the label uh, was uh, present on these particular molecules. You can see that these then line up uh, to generate the map in blue uh, that's shown in the middle uh, that can then be compared to the reference genome in which the um, uh, position of these marks uh, is identified uh, in silico. And as is quite evident, this region, uh, the set of molecules, uh, map very precisely to chromosome uh, 3 in this case. So uh, to, uh, we uh, previously um, applied this combination of whole genome sequencing and uh, bio-nano optical mapping uh, to a number of cancer cell lines uh, to be able to show that uh, there were, in fact, a large number of previously unrecognized or unrecognizable structural variations. But we were much more interested in seeing if we could apply these to uh, particular uh, leukemia patients. Uh, and so we uh, obtained samples from 12 uh, leukemia patients. Most of those were AML patients, although we had uh, two um, uh, acute lymphoblastic lymph leukemias and one uh, B-cell lymphoma. Uh, these were all karyotype before we uh, began the study, uh, and uh, additional um, uh, standard genomic analysis was, had been performed. So our approach then was to do optical mapping and whole genome uh, sequencing on each of these samples, take those data, merge them to be able to generate uh, a collection of uh, structural variants and uh, point uh, single nucleotide variants uh, that we then uh, treated by um, a, a bioinformatics pipeline to remove those polymorphisms that were likely present in the genome and not uh, somatic uh, mutations that were present 
only in the cancer. And after removing those uh, polymorphisms, then we were left with a collection of somatic uh, mutations. So in many cases, there were concordance between the optical mapping and the whole genome sequencing. So here is uh, one case in which we identified a translocation both by optical mapping and by whole genome sequencing. So by the optical mapping, you can see on the left side of these individual molecules, uh, they map very precisely to uh, chromosome 3, whereas on the right side of these molecules, uh, they map to chromosome 2, indicating that in the purple region, there's been a crossover between uh, fusion between chromosome 3 and chromosome 2 in this sample. And if we look at the whole genome sequencing, we can actually find um, uh, reads that span that junction between chromosome 3 and chromosome 2. Now, and to go back to the um, uh, computational approach to dealing with these data, the whole genome uh, sequencing data are um, uh, treated uh, or run through pipelines that involve identification of structural variants using uh, uh, standard uh, pipelines, bioinformatic pipelines, as well as looking at uh, single nucleotide uh, variants. Uh, and these are then filtered to, bring, to retain only those uh, uh, variants that are of high quality, uh, both for the optical mapping uh, and the whole genome sequencing. These two sets of data are then merged uh, to give a non-redundant set of structural variants and single nucleotide variants. Uh, and then, as I indicated previously, uh, applied uh, uh, our pipeline um, to remove those uh, variants that were likely uh, germline, uh, just germline polymorphisms. Now, then, the, we do that by comparing the variants that we identified in each of these patient samples uh, to a large database of known uh, polymorphisms. And we assume if that polymorphism has been identified before, uh, then it's likely a germline uh, variant and not a somatic variant. So that's uh, fairly straightforward for the single nucleotide uh, variants <coughs> because those are well characterized. With regard to the structural variants, uh, we've been fortunate to be able to have access to um, a recent set of, of samples that were um, uh, obtained by uh, Pui Kwok at UCSF and his colleagues who looked at 150 uh, normal individuals uh, to identify uh, large structural variants uh, and to identify those that were basically polymorphic in the population. And so with that database, as well as some database, some uh, samples that were, have been collected at BioNano Genomics, uh, we've been able to exclude a large number of the um, structural variants uh, that we think are uh, germline uh, polymorphisms. And that leaves us in with just a set of uh, somatic uh, structural variants and single nucleotide variants. Uh, and uh, in looking at these individual samples, it's very clear uh, that the majority of structural variants uh, that we see in our patient samples are actually uh, germline. So as you can see about uh, in these individual samples, looking at the number of high quality uh, 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 deletions that we identified, the vast majority of those are germline, shown in yellow here, whereas only a small fraction of those are somatic. So this um, filtering for known germline polymorphisms is quite critical. Um, So uh, for most cases, when people are looking at trying to identify what are somatic variants uh, in a tumor versus what are germlines, uh, the standard approach is to do the same analysis on both uh, uh, germline material and uh, tumor material, and then look for those that are unique to the tumor material. The, the difficulty with um, uh, leukemia uh, or the reason why it's very useful for being able to do the analysis in the first place, is that the standard source of germline material uh, for somebody with a tumor has been the blood. But in our case, the uh, tumor is, in fact, the blood. Uh, so it's very difficult to get material that we can use uh, as the reference uh, 
uh, for the germline for each individual. However, in a couple of cases, we were able to circumvent this by taking advantage of the fact that the uh, patient sample is not 100% tumor, but has a small uh, percentage of normal um, uh, cells uh, within that sample. So the, from the patient um, uh, leukemia sample, most of the material is the tumor, and that's what we analyze uh, and um, for being able to determine the structural variants and the uh, uh, single nucleotide variants. And that analysis for uh, one patient is shown on the bottom left of the slide uh, in what is a circos plot in which the chromosomes are aligned in a circle starting from chromosome one uh, going clockwise around to uh, the X or Y chromosome. Uh, and in the center are shown the uh, translocations or inversions and then uh, in the uh, central ring are shown the copy number changes uh, that are associated with that sample. And as you can see from the, this analysis, from the circles plot of the um, tumor sample, the leukemia sample, there are quite a number of uh, translocations, including a, a chromothripsis of uh, chromosome 8, uh, much of which ends up on chromosome 3. So to be able to uh, determine what was actually germline uh, variants versus the somatic variants. Uh, we took the sample and stimulated growth of the resident normal T cells by appropriate growth factor uh, stimulations, uh, and then uh, uh, that uh, enriched the population for T cells that we could then purify uh, by T cell sorting. Uh, and then we could do the analysis, the same sort of analysis of the bio nano and whole genome sequencing on the normal T cells uh, to generate uh, the, the results shown on the lower right. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, the normal cells lack all of the translocations and inversions that are present uh, in the uh, leukemia sample. And then by comparis uh, comparing all of the structural variants that we see, uh, in the uh, patient uh, sample to that we see in the normal sample, um, we can um, uh, determine how accurate uh, our um, bioinformatic pipeline is for removing the germline polymorphism. And by the analysis, that analysis, uh, we were able to calculate that our false discovery rate for uh, single nucleus for um, structural variation uh, was less than 6%. So here is an example of both the, the germline and the um, uh, somatic variant pr present uh, in the uh, leukemia cell. So um, here we have the T cell uh, sample. As you can see, this T cell sample has a germline mu uh, mutation of 132 kilobase uh, deletion that is also present, as to be expected, in the leukemia sample. Uh, but in the leukemia sample, in addition to that germline, right adjacent to the, uh, that uh, germline variant, we see a large inversion uh, of about three, and about three megabases that's not present in the germline. Uh, so this is one we call from our, um, uh, from our bioinformatic pipeline uh, that then is also uh, clearly evident uh, in the sample. So... Um, in all, uh, uh, the um, ability of our uh, system to identify structural variation and distinguish between uh, structural, uh, somatic structural variation and um, a normal uh, germline variants uh, uh, differs depending on the um, uh, particular structural variation that we look at. So a large, uh, a reasonable fraction of the uh, gains and duplications uh, are actually some that we identify in our sample are actually somatic, whereas deletions, insertions, and inversions, most of the ones that uh, we uh, identify uh, are polymorphic uh, and, ger uh, and germline, and only a small fraction are actually somatic. On the other hand, the, the interchromosomal translocations that we see in our sample are exclusively um, somatic. Uh, and so um, asking how well the, t uh, the two different um, methods, the whole genome sequencing 
and optical mapping are identifying these types of uh, structural variants, it's clear that the uh, two systems are quite synergistic, uh, that the whole genome sequencing is very good at picking up uh, gains, whereas the optical mapping uh, is much better at picking up um, losses and insertions and inversions, and then both of them are very effective at picking up translocations. So um, then looking specifically at some of the samples and how uh, they might impact the uh, progression of the tumor, uh, we can see that uh, in several cases we're identifying uh, variants uh, that are um, clearly have a functional consequence uh, for the patient sample. So for example, we see on the P10 locus in one of our samples uh, that on one chromosome, there is a large inversion seen at the upper left-hand side uh, in which the inversion interrupts the P10 locus, whereas on the other chromosome, uh, there is a deletion as seen uh, as evident by the whole genome sequencing uh, uh, using the um, uh, read number to be able to identify copy number. We can see that one of the copies has been deleted uh, right within the P10 locus. So one chromosome uh, in the, this patient sample has P10 interrupted by an inversion, and the other chromosome has P10 interrupted by a um, deletion. So this is clearly a compound heterozygote uh, eliminating this tumor suppressor gene. Same situation exists in another sample uh, in which the BCL6 uh, locus, another tumor suppressor gene, is interrupted on one chromosome by an inversion and on the other chromosome by a deletion. So I should point out that neither of uh, those uh, inversions uh, would be readily or readily evident from the whole genome sequencing, so the identification of that as a compound heterozygote uh, interrupting the tumor suppressor gene uh, was not, would not be evident uh, solely from the whole genome sequencing. So in looking over all the samples, uh, we've identified a number of genes that are recurrently uh, mutated, even in this relatively small uh, patient sample size. So what's shown uh, in this uh, on the left are genes that have been previously associated with leukemia and plotted uh, on the um, uh, y-axis uh, is the uh, number uh, and types of mutations that are evident across the multiple samples in the particular gene listed uh, to the left. Uh, and uh, the, many of these are structural variants. The ones in green are uh, single nucleotide variants. Uh, in the next uh, set of, of um, genes are ones that are been associated with cancer in the past, uh, but uh, have not been associated with leukemia. So we're seeing that many of the structural variants are affecting cancer genes that uh, have not been previously associated with leukemia. And then on the right are a large collection of genes that have not been associated with cancer previously, uh, but we found we find recurrently um, affected by structural variants uh, in uh, our patient samples. Now, and um, whether or not to, to begin to assess whether or not these are relevant to the cancer progression, we can actually look at these genes uh, and then ask um, to what extent does um, either expression changes or copy number changes uh, in these genes observed in uh, pre-existing cancer genome atlas data affect outcomes. And so for uh, this gene, for example, the ENPP2, which encodes a, um, a phosphatase, phosphodiesterase, that stimulates production of uh, lysophosphatidic acid, which in turn stimulates uh, cell proliferation and chemotaxis. Those, those patients in the TCGA data uh, that have high expression of the um, uh, of this gene, shown in red, have poorer outcomes uh, than those um, patients who have low expression of this gene. A similar story uh, exists for uh, the ZFPM2, which is a zinc finger protein associated with uh, the GATA transcription factor and also affects transcription. 
Again, high expression in red is associated with poor outcome, uh, whereas low expression uh, is associated with uh, better outcomes. Uh, and again, AFAP, uh, actin uh, filament associated protein, uh, which is a SARC um, uh, binding partner, uh, also its expression is associated with differences in outcome. So these genes that we've identified by structural variations, uh, structural variants, somatic structural variants in leukemia patients, uh, and, but hadn't been previously associated with cancer, clearly affect um, uh, outcomes. So these are genes, I think, that are worth uh, further study to understand uh, the progression uh, and uh, etiology of leukemia. Um, so those were genes in which structural variations affected the structural gene uh, in which somatic variations were affecting the structural gene. But we also found a number of structural variants that lie uh, in intergenic regions that don't affect the structural uh, gene of any uh, nearby um, coding regions. Uh, and uh, what we did was ask whether or not these were these uh, intergenic uh, structural variants were resident near um, known cancer genes. And the way we did that was computationally uh, by shuffling uh, the uh, position of the cancer genes relative to the uh, structural variants uh, several hundred times and then uh, uh, identifying, comparing what was actually observed with what the sh uh, was expected by that shuffling mechanism. And what we find uh, uh, plotted at the uh, upper portion of these plots in blue uh, is the uh, probability uh, that this um, was non-random, the likelihood that this was non-random. Uh, and as uh, you can see, the um, structural variants, that um, many of the structural variants lie very near some of these cancer genes, uh, particularly for those on the, shown on the right that were structural variants uh, that were translocations or deletions. So, um, what might these intergenic structural variants do? Uh, we suspect that some of them <coughs> excuse me, uh, might affect uh, the expression of the associated gene. For example, by deleting an enhancer that would reduce expression of the gene, or by duplicating an enhancer to increase the expression of a gene, or by fusing uh, topologically associated um, uh, domains to connect a gene to a novel enhancer that might alter uh, up or down uh, the expression of that gene. Uh, so uh, to be able to uh, assess that as we have done in the past, uh, we've uh, used a technique called uh, high c um, or high, uh, chromosome capture techniques, um, but for the sake of time I won't uh, dwell on this, but simply to say that the um, this sort of technique can identify topologically associated domains and identify um, uh, uh, where the genes reside uh, within that domain and point out potential interactions, as shown here, between one region of the genome of one region of chromosome and another region of chromosome that often uh, uh, defines enhancer promoter interactions. Uh, and in our study of, of um, uh, cell lines, cancer cell lines, we saw several examples in which topological domains were uh, uh, fused, bringing the um, uh, uh, tumor oncogene, such as MYC, in connection with a different um, uh, topological domain that then, uh, shown on the apex of this triangle on the left, uh, connect the enhancer uh, in this new domain on chromosome 7 with the gene on chromosome 8. Uh, in a similar case uh, on the right, uh, showing uh, the activation of MYC by fusion, fusion to a topological domain on chromosome 4. So um, how can we tell whether or not uh, these structural variants are affecting the expression of the associated gene? Well, if it is affecting the expression, it should affect affect the expression of the gene only in cis. So only one of the two alleles uh, would be increased or decreased in expression. And so if we look at 
polymorphic single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, across the gene uh, we can uh, that should be present in the genome at um, uh, 50-50, uh, equal amounts from both chromosomes. But if a translocation, uh, shown in blue here, <clears throat> um, alters the expression of uh, the associated gene, either by decreasing expression or increasing expression, then the uh, uh, variant that's present on that particular chromosome would be higher or lower uh, than that on the uh, homo homologous chromosome. So we were able to see uh, a number of cases uh, that this was uh, true. So here we have a, a, a translocation that lies near the BCL2 gene. On the bottom uh, of this uh, graph, we see the um, from the whole genome sequencing the proportion of the two variants um, each column is a different polymorphism within that gene, and we can see across the gene that the uh, that in the genome uh, these two poly uh, two alleles are present at fairly equal amounts, whereas in the RNA, which is shown right ab above, uh, the um, only one of the two alleles is represented uh, at significant amount in the RNA. Similar case is true for uh, BRCA1. So in both these cases, we have good evidence that the translocation, even though it doesn't affect the gene body itself, is clearly altering the expression of the associated gene. And what we found is that for about 50% of these intragenic um, uh, structural variants, we see an alteration uh, in the um, expression of the associated gene. So the basic lessons from uh, these leukemia uh, samples is that uh, the majority of structural variants are, are not de detected, that are present in, in uh, these leukemia samples, are not detected by standard genomic tools. Uh, these structural variants recurrently affect genes previously associated with cancer, as well as many genes not previously linked to cancer. Uh, the copy number and expression alterations in these newly identified uh, genes uh, affect patient outcomes, uh, and many of these somatic structural variants are intergenic and affect expression of the adjacent uh, so, uh, genes. Uh, so in the last uh, few minutes, let me just point out that we've now moved beyond the leukemia uh, to begin to ask whether or not we can apply these same techniques uh, to solid tumors. And what, working with the folks at BioNano, we've been able to show that we can extract uh, high-quality DNA from as little as 10 milligrams of tissue, as shown here uh, adjacent to the ruler. Uh, and we've applied this recently to HPV-induced head and neck cancers. Uh, I should point out that the, uh, one of the few cancers that is increasing in frequency or uh, um, uh, or a pharyngeal uh, cancers that are associated with HPV, either HPV 16 or 33. And the expectation is that this uh, increase in incidence is going to continue um, uh, over the next couple of years. Um, so the normal uh, mechanism for HPV-induced uh, tumor genesis as uh, determined from studies on cervical cancer for many years is that the uh, HPV becomes integrated in the genome in a way that eliminates the um, E2 gene product uh, that then allows activation of E6 and E7. Uh, E6 tar targets and inhibits RB uh, to lead to cell cycle progression, and e, I'm sorry, E7 uh, inhibits RB. E6 inhibits P53, which um, uh, eliminates the surveillance of the genome and causes genomic instability. Uh, so uh, we were interested in applying these tools to, um, uh, to head and neck cancer because the data uh, to date suggests that the model from uh, cervical cancer doesn't really apply to uh, head and neck cancer. Uh, in particular, data like this from uh, 2017 suggests that HPV is associated not with necessarily production of E6 and E7, but rather with amplification of specific regions of the genome. So this is looking at copy number uh, from TCG, TCGA data on um, uh, one of the oral pharyngeal uh, tumors. 
uh, showing that one region of the genome is highly amplified, and uh, in the middle of that <coughs> excuse me, amplified region, uh, HPV is inserted. Uh, and in these other two cases, HPV is inserted on, uh, on the breakpoints uh, of the amplified DNA, suggesting that it may be functioning as a, uh, uh, to generate episomal uh, human DNA that then replicates through the HPV. And so we've uh, used our techniques uh, to look at the structural uh, alterations in uh, various um, uh, head and neck cancers and can identify a large number of structural variants. Uh, one of those, uh, in this case, affects the RB gene, um, which is not quite consistent with the, uh, 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 the cervical cancer paradigm. Um, and the other um, point here is the insertion of the HPV, which we could identify by the optical mapping uh, and uh, combining the optical mapping with the whole genome sequencing, uh, we can identify that um, HPV is inserted uh, into the genome. And like the uh, example from the previous study, uh, we see that this is leading to amplification of the local region around it uh, um, by, in this case, uh, tandem duplication of this region rather than episomal amplification. So we're continuing these studies to be able to analyze uh, further the uh, information of the nature of the genome rearrangements associated with head and neck cancer. Uh, but this is um, sufficient to uh, determine that we can do these analyses with very small amounts of tumor material uh, and that HPV-induced head and neck cancers uh, carry many structural variations and that uh, these HPV insertions can induce local duplication and amplification. Uh, and that, again, optical mapping provides otherwise inaccessible structural clarity of HPV-induced genome alterations. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation. I just want to thank uh, the, the folks in the Institute for Personalized Medicine uh, that, were, um, that contributed to this, uh, as well as the, my colleagues at BioNanoGenomics and uh, members of the uh, Department of uh, uh, on, uh, Hematological Oncology and otolaryngology uh, that were instrumental in uh, providing us with tumor samples. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex. Thank you, Dr. Broach. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We will conduct the Q&A portion of the webinar after the presentations have concluded. Next up is Dr. Hasty. Please go ahead. Thank you, Christy, um, and thank you, Dr. Broach. That was a, a really interesting presentation, very exciting results. Um, now I will uh, take the next few minutes to introduce some uh, really powerful new advances uh, coming this year uh, in the bio-nanotechnology. Um, so a couple years ago, uh, in 2017, um, we launched the Sapphire system. It uh, replaced its predecessor, Iris, and provided users with about a tenfold higher throughput. In 2018, we launched our proprietary labeling chemistry, uh, DLS. Um, this single enzyme, non-damaging, high-fidelity chemistry has largely replaced the previous uh, multi-enzyme uh, DNA nicking uh, chemistry, NLRS. The benefits are obvious when looking at this comparison of the methods. Um, on the bottom, the non-damaging DLS chemistry is shown to generate contiguous chromosome arm length maps, um, while on the top, the, the uh, older uh, NIC-based chemistry um, generates smaller maps, which uh, fragment the genome. Um, combining Sapphire and DLS, uh, we now offer a high-throughput, high-sensitivity whole genome structural variation solution at a low cost. Uh, this year, we launch uh, new sample prep kits, new Sapphire chips, and new bioinformatic pipelines. Um, BioNanoPrep SP is a scalable, fast sample prep system 
with this, we cut the time for DNA isolation from two days uh, to just four hours. Our, our current DNA extraction workhorse is based on agarose gel uh, plug isolations. This method, uh, these methods are robust, produce high quality DNA, and work for a variety of input part, uh, types. However, they're not fast and not automatable and need significant hands-on time. Uh, w with with uh, PrepSP, lysing cells and digesting proteins is done in solution. The cells are, uh, are, are digested in solution, and um, after uh, the digestion and lysis, the DNA is removed from contaminants by binding the DNA to a paramagnetic disc, and which can be washed and moved to a new tube for elution of pure DNA. Um, this process takes just four hours uh, to process six samples, and uh, allowing a single technician to process 12 samples per day. Um, currently supported inputs for BioNano Prep SP are uh, just 400 microliters of blood, which can be fresh or frozen. Um, we see no performance difference. Yields from uh, from blood are uh, about six uh, micrograms of genomic DNA, um, or about 1.5 million uh, cells from a from a cell culture. Uh, which also could be fresh or frozen, and this yields about 10, gram, 10 micrograms of DNA. For some uh, current users and all future customers, um, we are introducing our new chip, which is the 3 by 1300 gigabase chip. Uh, this, um, th uh, this chip uh, replaces the 2 by 320 chip. Um, that some uh, that are that our uh, current customers are using for some of our current customers. Um, every new Sapphire shipping starting today has a dual cartridge configuration for continuous operation and can accept two three by thirteen hundred chips. Uh, so you can load uh, six samples onto the system at a, at one time um, and and run them all automatically. We will also offer a factory upgrade to all existing sapphires available later this year. With the uh, 3 by 1300 chip and the dual loader, users can run uh, six human genomes at 100x coverage in, uh, in, in just one day. Or uh, users can run uh, three genomes uh, with up to 400x coverage in less than two days. This high throughput um, can be had for as low as uh, 39 cents per gigabase. Um, here's one example run of DLS labeled human DNA from SP prep on a 3 by 1300 chip. Um, here we generated uh, four terabases of data with an N50 of 320 kilobases in just 16 hours. Um, in order to fully leverage the data output by a uh, 1.3 terabase flow cell, we are releasing new bioinformatics software. Um, the new software de de detects low allelic fraction SVs from heterogeneous samples, genome-wide, at high positive predictive value. Um, we've demonstrated uh, approximately 90% sensitivity for translocations, inversions, deletions, insertions, and duplications at only 5% allele fraction. Um, furthermore, at, at 1,000x coverage, i.e. just one um, full uh, 3 by 3 uh, 1300 chip, um, sensitivity can be further increased down to 1.5% allele fraction. No other technology can do this, um, <clears throat> detect such broad range of structural variants genome-wide at such low allele frequency. And all this can be done for as low as $500 per sample. Also on the software side, we're launching BioNano Compute On Demand. This is a cloud-based bioinformatics, this is a cloud-based bioinformatics solution. It stores uh, no data in the cloud and has built-in data security. Uh, we think this, uh, this is going to be a welcome tool for, for much of our customer base. Um, <clears throat> 
Our uh, graphical user interface now includes a whole genome structural variation visual visualization tool, uh, the Circus Plot, and this uh, is an interact. This is interactive and can be used to navigate the genome. So, for a closer view of variants, um, all all variants detected can be clicked on. Clicking on a variant will bring us into a, a zoomed-in view. Um, here, showing a region of a cancer genome that has a linked fusion, um, including fusions uh, that were not reported by single read, uh, short read or long read sequencing studies of this cell line. Um, finally, uh, variants of interest can be simply selected and output into a PDF report with the circus plot as well as other sample and analysis specific data. Um, we believe uh, this is now providing a clean fluid analysis workflow that will make studies such as the one that Dr. Broach presented and other uh, other uh, larger and deep, deeper and broader studies uh, much more routine. So in summary, um, BioNano calls all major SD types with sensitiv sensitivities far exceeding NGS only approaches at uh, extremely low allele fraction. BioNano detects all SDs identified by cytogenetic methods and thousand, thousands more. Compared to array, BioNano calls much smaller events, adds order and orientation to duplication events, and calls inversions and balanced translocations as well. In genetic disease, BioNano can be combined with NGS to call all variants, um, detecting compound hetero, heterozyg uh, heterozygous mutations, and in cancer, BioNano's unbiased approach uh, detects SDs affecting genes not previously associated uh, with specific tumor types, enabling discovery of new biomarkers for patients, patient stratification and therapeutic targets. Um, so with that, I'm, I will conclude, and uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Broach as well as Genome Web for hosting this seminar. Um, Dr. Broach and I will be happy to answer any uh, questions that people have now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hasty. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to give us feedback by taking our exit survey. All right, we'll now start the Q&A. Uh, James, the first question is for you. Um, could you please clarify what you mean when you say that optical mapping provides insight into structural variants that is um, otherwise inaccessible? Um, what does optical mapping provide that differs or improves on what long read sequencing provides? I think that um, Alex provided an example uh, of uh, some of the structural variants that <clears throat> uh, are not even uh, evident to long read sequencing, um, uh, and um, I should point out that the long read sequencing, um, uh, while uh, uh, a very nice tool, uh, is not as readily accessible uh, and not uh, uh, on a cost basis uh, uh, comparable to the optical mapping techniques. And you talked about um, performance differences between whole genome sequencing and optical mapping. Um, it looks like um, WGS did well for gains while OM did better for insertions and inversions. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the principle behind that um, and, and why that is? <clears throat> so um, the, um, for gains, uh, which are basically duplications, copy numbers, at least in the uh, versions of the optical mapping, uh, the uh, ability to count uh, molecules uh, was a little better on the whole genome sequencing than it was on optical mapping. That probably could improve with you uh, go to um, uh, higher coverage. Uh, in many cases, and I should point out that the graph I showed uh, were things that were um, uh, defined um, precisely by either whole genome sequencing or optical mapping. In many of the cases that it was identified by whole genome sequencing but not necessarily by optical mapping, uh, one, the 
there was confirmation in the optical mapping that the whole genome sequence was correct. Uh, but in some cases, the translocated piece, for example, uh, wasn't long enough uh, to be able to identify exactly where the second chromosome uh, uh, um, came from. So um, uh, it, uh, the number of cases in which the whole genome sequencing was confirmed by optical mapping or the optical mapping result was confirmed by whole genome sequence was much higher than those that were called uh, precisely by one method or another. Alex, the next question is for you. Um, for the BioNano Prep SP, um, is FFPE an appropriate sample type? Um, no, FFP is not appropriate sample type for um, for for biotechnologies in general right now. Is there a point at which um, that will be a, a sample type that you can use? Um, probably not in the near future, but um, potentially uh, when when uh, uh, information density on molecules could be high enough. Um, to take advantage, but the the problem, the the fundamental problem is that the mo the molecules after treatment are are too short, and uh, they 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 really uh, a lot of times won't span um, the repetitive regions and allow the structural variation analysis by by any method, um, just because of the 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 extensive damage to the DNA. And can BioNanos technology be used to identify HPV integration sites? Uh, yes, well, Jim um, showed a really nice example of, of one HPV integration um, that was identified uh, in his studies. Um, in addition, there are a few publications uh, where uh, targeting label, labeling has been used to um, specifically target and identify uh, HPV sites um, by using a different uh, labeling color on, on top of the uh, normal pattern. This is not currently a, a commercial offering of bionanogenomics, but it is a, a method that's been, been used by, by customers on our platform. Um, Jim, why could saliva not be used uh, to identify germline variants? Uh, saliva actually has a large amount of leukocytes uh, present uh, so, in fact, uh, even uh, though it's not coming directly from the blood, uh, it is contaminated with the uh, leukemia cells. And could you tell us what database you use to look for polymorphic uh, structural variants? Basically, everything that we can get our hands on. All right, fair enough. Um, Alex, um, is BioNano currently used in clinical diagnostic labs, or is it still focused in research fields? Um, BioNano is not used for clinical diagnostics yet. Uh, however, there are some uh, groups that are um, embarking in, uh, in in testing to see if they can uh, they can use it as a lab developed test. Okay, great, um, Jim. Could you tell us, uh, when you were talking about your compound P10 case, uh, was the P10 deletion detected by optical mapping? Um, I'd have to go back and, and look uh, to see whether or not that was the case. It was, uh, it just very, uh, it was very evident from the, um, um, from the whole genome sequencing because we could get a very precise uh, uh, endpoint for where the deletion began, uh, and we probably can detect the deletion, uh, but the resolution of the optical mapping uh, is just a couple of hundred base pairs, uh, not down to the nucleotide level. And is it known whether transposons account for the high frequency of germline, of, uh, germline structural variants? Uh, so I uh, I don't know uh, I haven't looked um, uh, extensively at the germline uh, structural variants. Uh, Pui Kwok's uh, recent uh, publication in Nature Genetics probably uh, addresses at least some of those uh, questions. <laughs> 
All right. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we'd like to thank James Broach, Alex Hasty, and our sponsor, BioNano Genomics. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.